colleagues and friends of Challenges Forum. Welcome to the last day of the virtual Challenges Annual Forum VCAF 20. This has been a very interesting week with a lot of thought provoking and rewarding conversations, using our global partnership as a multilateral platform for shaping the debate on peace operations. And we also welcome those of you joining for the first time today to enjoy the high level conversations and hear the key takeaways from this week's free Dialogue Strand Conversations. And we want to send our sincere thanks to our free co-hosts for leading these conversations in such an excellent and inclusive way. So thanks to the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI, to the Institute for Security Studies, ISS, South Africa, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. My name is Susanna Alfors from the Challenges Forum International Secretariat. And please engage in the discussions today and share your views on this topic with others. And the hashtag we use on social media for this event is VCAP20. And before moving on, I would just like to remind you kindly to answer the survey that you have received both those of you attending the whole week's uh, sessions and those of you joining for the opening or the closing session today. We really appreciate your comments, especially as this is the first time we do a virtual event. So please share your opinions and help us to continuously improve our work. I am now delighted to welcome our distinguished moderator of today's first session on how to ensure the primacy of politics of peace operations. Mr. Jean-Marie Gueno, our own Challenges Forum patron, member of the UN High Level Advisory Board on Mediation, former USG for UN Peacekeeping and president on the International Crisis Group. Welcome, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Um, we are very privileged uh, this morning to have a, a panel of very experienced leaders to discuss what has been the theme of this challenges conference the primacy of politics uh, jan martin uh, uh, has been a, a leader in many difficult situations uh, from timor to nepal <coughs> to <laughs> libya uh, and he has been a member of the so-called hippo uh, report and so is particularly well placed to to look at the primacy of politics because this is the report that uh, made a big push for returning to politics so i'm very happy to to have him on board uh, karen landgren had the same kind of uh, background having been in the field in various types of uh, missions in uh, uh, political mission uh, office uh, in, in Burundi, uh, uh, for instance, in Nepal also, but uh, also a, a more traditional uh, peace uh, operation in, in Liberia. Uh, and so she, she sees it from all angles. And now as the executive uh, director of the Security Council report, uh, she knows uh, what's going on in the kitchen, so to speak. Uh, uh, she has an insider's look on, on, on that. Uh, and then we also have uh, Said uh, Jinit, who is also who also combines uh, uh, headquarters experience with uh, with field experience, uh, having been uh, having worked on Burundi, having worked on the Great Lakes, having been the head of a regional office of the UN. I'm sure we will discuss that because it's uh, it's one of the important tools of the UN. But also having been the uh, Commissioner for Peace and Security of the African Union, so he can see uh, the U he saw the UN from within and from without, and that's uh, that's also a very important uh, perspective. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn <coughs> to uh, uh, to Jan. I'll ask uh, all of the speakers to be uh, very crisp so that we have a, a, a real discussion. And I think Jan, it would be good if you started us by. I mean, having been involved in the HIPPO report, I mean, uh, a few years later, has the council done a good job? Has the UN done a good job? Do you see real changes after that very uh, important report? 
when we framed the HIPPO recommendations, we direct a lot of them to how a um, peace operation might initially be mandated uh, in a way that had a clear political strategy. And of course, the irony is there hasn't been a peacekeeping operation, a new peacekeeping operation set up since the HIPPO report. Uh, and the small number of political missions that have been set up had their politics defined for them by the parties in Colombia. Um, Hudeida isn't really political in its function, it's purely military. Sudan is perhaps the most interesting test case, but the, the jury's out there. Um, so the question then becomes not so much have new missions been better conceived, uh, but have existing peace operations done better in sharpening their political strategies? Strategies. Uh, and I can't answer that mission by mission, uh, but I think one should look at have the conditions for that improved. Uh, and there are three key actors, the Secretariat, the Security Council and mission leadership. Has the Secretariat got better? Yes, in some ways, the Secretary-General's Executive Committee, um, the strategic coordination function in his office, uh, united regional divisions, independent reviews of operations, some pluses there. Has the Security Council got better? Well, Karen's much closer to that than I am, but uh, if it has, uh, um, I can't say I've noticed. Um, uh, and mission leadership, I'm afraid, uh, the politics around mission leadership have made it increasingly difficult for the Secretary General uh, to fill gaps in mission leadership uh, and ensure that there's the leadership on the ground at key moments. So not a great report card, I'm afraid. Thank you. Well, Karen, uh, Ian uh, just mentioned the Security Council. So as you look at the Security Council uh, now, uh, do you see it uh, doing a much worse job than when you were in charge of a mission? Yeah, that was an open invitation, I think, in, in Ian's framing of this. I just want to say that the HIPPO recommendations remain valid and important. Um, that, that hasn't changed. But the key issue, as Ian indicated, is that for a political strategy, it's not just about is the mission doing well or not, or the secretariat. You need that range of political actors to line up behind a given, a given strategy. And so what we're seeing where governments commit themselves to a course of action in the Security Council and then act at odds uh, with that bilaterally, whether that is about breaching Libya sanctions, now seen as a classic case of undermining a UN approach, or just yesterday uh, recognizing Morocco's sovereignty over Western uh, Sahara. Many other examples, widespread use of mercenaries running parallel peace processes. We need to acknowledge that for UN peace operations to become better at pursuing political solutions often means swimming against um, the current tide. Um, so it has become more difficult. And one question I would have is whether there is merit in the Secretary General calling out more explicitly those examples of powerful actors undermining UN peace operations. We need some Security Council members, uh, some members of the UN Secretariat to have the hard discussions and be frank about the challenges in the deadliest conflicts or the frozen conflicts and the incipient conflicts. It is so hard to find a conflict today that doesn't have P5 involvement and in some cases P5 stirring up. Uh, and I would say that we see some SG reports which frankly fail to shine a hard light on uh, the bad developments for fear of who they will offend, and that helps no one. Thank you. Said, uh, you, as I said, you've been inside and outside the United Nations, and uh, yes. so you, you, you can have a more distant look, and you can see the divisions of the UN. There are also the divisions of the African Union, to be honest, uh, which, which have been in evidence uh, in uh, recent yeah. years. So how do yeah. you see the situation now? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, yes, uh, this is a very interesting uh, question on how we see the political role of peace missions. And has it been increasing over the past years, especially since the last uh, reports? Uh, 
I, this is not quite evident in the field, to be fair. I mean, I have been observing. I have not been in charge of peacekeeping or peace operation, UN peace operation. I was leading uh, regional offices, but they have observed peace uh, operations from the AU side and from the UN side. And uh, from my uh, point of view, uh, it depends on the support they get from the Security Council. And as Karin has just said, Unfortunately, the Council is more often <laughs> divided on a number of issues that affect, uh, that has uh, some impact on the political role of the peace uh, mission. And uh, it also depends on the quality of the, the, the head of mission. Uh, I think it's important from head mission to another on how he or she can get involved in political processes, the, the kind of rapport she or he can uh, develop with the host country, with regional actors, with international actors, can, uh, and the trust he could be given, can uh, give him or her more political role. And the other point I want to make, which was made by Karit, is the fact that, unfortunately, the interferences, the role played by regional actors, speaking, for example, in the case of Africa, regional, immediate regional actors, international actors, members of the council, are not leaving a lot of room for peace missions to play a particular role. We have the example of the DRC. The DRC is a huge mission there, MONUSCO. And yet, when it came to the political dialogue, the, the government went to the AU, uh, Adam Kojo, and the, later on to Senko. We have the case in, uh, in, in all other missions where, in Sahel, where we have the role of, uh, prominent role of France, of Algeria in, in, in leading the peace agreement and uh, the G5, which is leaving limited role to the mission to play a political role. So the presence of many actors and the interferences, quote unquote, uh, are not giving a lot of room for, uh, for political mi for missions. And last point is I, from my experience, the port commission and the UN officials in general, whether in voice or special representatives, or they have more chance to get involved in political processes if they work closely with the regional, uh, with the region, uh, with the African Union in this case, and the regional economic groupings. They have more chance. The more they work closely, the better they could be associated to political processes. Well, you've raised a lot of points, uh, Said, and there is one point that I think all three have raised is the importance of leadership, which is uh, an issue that uh, Challenges Forum has often been uh, focused on. Um, you stress, uh, Jan, that there was uh, less, less space uh, for the Secretary General now to appoint the right leaders. My own experience is that the single most important uh, factor in the success or failure of a mission at the end of the day is the quality of the leader Absolutely. Uh, that's uh, that's vital so what can what can be done to uh to to protect the uh, the space uh, so that the the right people are uh, are selected uh, do you think uh, it's it's just the secretary general or can there be i mean ways to to protect him from the pressure of uh, the big powers who wants to answer that yeah, we dropped one suggestion into the HIPPO report, although it wasn't very much highlighted as a recommendation, uh, and that was that the Secretary General should have a kind of panel, panel of the wise, a panel of former Secretary, special representatives, for example, who would play a role in interviewing those who the Secretary General was going to consider for possible mission leadership roles make sure they understood what the role is, because frankly, I'm not always sure that some of the people that whose governments wish them on the Secretary General necessarily have a very clear understanding of, uh, uh, of how difficult the role is, especially for someone who has no previous experience of working in the UN system. Um, but that was also intended as a device that might shield the Secretary General a little from some of the member state pressures. Um, 
well, maybe that's uh, pie in the sky because what we've seen is exactly exactly the opposite. Uh, and to have Libya and Sudan in such crucial political situations this year go for protracted periods uh, without SRSGs because members of the council are, are making it impossible for the Secretary General to, to make an appointment. I mean, that's really unforgivable. Yes, what you say reminds me of a, a reaction I had when I, I saw people lobbying to get the position. I thought this was a, a definite uh, reason not to appoint them because it showed that they had not understood the nature of the job, uh, that they did not understood that success or failure depended also on many factors that they didn't control. So anybody in his right mind wouldn't lobby for that kind of difficult uh, job. But Karen. At the risk of stating the obvious, uh, for that to happen, for the process Ian, Ian and Hippo have, have proposed, the Secretary General has to want it. Uh, he has to want to distance himself from the transactional aspects of appointing SRSGs and special envoys. And I would add that Western Sahara and Burundi are without their special envoys as well for some considerable time. Um, but it is one of the currencies an SG can trade in with member states. So if the will isn't there to create that distance, it's not going to happen. And I think it's fair to say we haven't seen a push for a, a, a more structured and formal appointments process uh, under this SG. Mm -hmm. And you think that is uh, that is uh, that could end with the uh, with the new U.S. administration? Because if one wants to, I mean, uh, play the devil's advocate, so to speak, uh, you could say that uh, in a configuration of intensifying uh, U.S.-China uh, uh, competition and with a U.S. that uh, didn't have enormous uh, sympathy for the United Nations, uh, that. Uh, was that was shrinking the uh, the space for for the SG? You think that uh, the Biden administration offers a new hope for more space for the UN? Said? <laughs> yes, I, 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 we we hope so. I think I mean we are hopeful. I mean with the with so I mean with uh, after all the the damage is uh, done by this uh, current administration, including the most recent uh, positions taken by this administration, we all can only hope with the new administration, there will be some kind of uh, normalcy in the way uh, we deal with the United Nations. And I think, you know, I am, I, 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 I am a little bit concerned because of the recent incidents when the Secretary General has made very good selections for uh, special representatives, and there have been uh, opposed by some members at the Council, I think something should be initiated, including people like us, I mean, in the, I mean, the panels and the independent uh, personalities should, uh, should speak loudly and say that we should restore the full authority of the Secretary General. I mean, I always compare because I have done both organizations, the AU and the UN. In the AU, when the chairperson of the EU Commission appoints a special representative, he has not is not supposed to consult the members of the Council of the PSC or any other member. He's free. So uh, the chairman of the commission has more authority than the, the Secretary General. We know it because of the, the, the charter. But I think we should start a process so that the Secretary General could get his full authority because it's, the, he's appointing his special representatives, not the special representatives of the Secretary Council. But at the same time, they should be able to work with members of the Secretary Council, and especially the the key members of the council should find the balance, but not to the, uh, to the extreme of opposing the, the, the selection of the Secretary General. I think nobody should oppose the selection of the Secretary General. Yes, and what you, what you say there, I mean, I think of the USC, where the pr procedure is formally very different, where indeed the, uh, the representatives have to be confirmed by the, by the uh, institutions of the USC. Uh, which is very different from the, from the UN. So in, in theory, the, there is a space uh, for the Secretary General, but he has to, he has to use it, uh, yeah. uh, obviously. Um, I would want to turn, I mean, in, the, in, the, in the leading questions that uh, we have to, to address, I mean, there's this question of the role of the Security Council, how it develops uh, mandates. Myself, I, uh, 
I have a sense that in a way, uh, in, in, it, it, in a way, it's a continuation of what we just discussed with SRG. Uh, the, the, Secretary, the Security Council should not get into too much details in uh, developing a political strategy. That uh, it, it should leave the uh, uh, the, 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 the SIG with some, with space to really shape the strategy uh, rather than try to micromanage it. But uh, maybe Karen, you you've been looking at the way. Uh, uh, the, the kitchen is working, how the Security Council is working. What do you think of the uh, mandate uh, making uh, responsibilities of the of the Security Council? So I think it's not all bad news. I think to come back to something Ian alluded to at the beginning, in most cases, the Security Council doesn't have to invent a political strategic decision, not only because there are so few missions being set up in the first place, but because they will in most cases be based on something like a, a, a deal, a peace agreement in which that direction is already identified. Um, in those situations, what is left to the secretariat, including the SRSG is to work out how to support that existing or defined direction, both operationally and politically. In many, many cases, the uh, Security Council resolutions in question could articulate the political strategy, the core political aim more clearly. Uh, there are many long resolutions in which one searches in vain to see where the real core is from which all the other mandated activities should, should derive. But I see some improvement here and even in an extra, extra large size resolution such as MINUSCA in the Central African Republic, it has become more structured and coherent in the last few years in how it sets out the expectations of, of the mission. I think the two problem areas are uh, where there is no original deal among the main actors or the deal has been abandoned, no peace to keep. And second uh, is council members still unbreakable habit of piling too much direction, too much extraneous matter into uh, mandate resolutions. You know, we look at an example from last year over UNAMA, where after a US-China spat over the wording of the UNAMA resolution, specifically over a reference to Belt and Road Initiative in the resolution, a spat that lasted from April to September, that resolution went from being uh, 12 pages long to being three pages long. So it was, it's such a good illustration of how little is really essential to the mission carrying out its, um, its core work. Less is more. Resolutions should for focus more on the core what and stay away from the how, the tactics, the processes. But I would say this isn't a technical matter. Ultimately, it's dependent on there being a higher level of trust between the council, uh, the secretariat, including the peace operation and the financing. Uh, the trust to leave things to the mission and the secretariat to get the details right. Yes, um, Ian. I, I very strongly agree with the view that the council shouldn't try to micromanage political strategies and should largely leave it uh, for those to be developed and interpreted uh, on the ground, I mean, not just by the Secretariat, but by mission leadership on the ground. But I'd add one point. I mean, I, I, I don't think political strategies should even originate with the Security Council, even in general terms. They originate with a recommendation of the Secretary General. And the Security Council is never gonna take better decisions than uh, is put to them on the basis of good analysis and good recommendations from the Secretariat. 15 different member states around the table, different levels of knowledge, different interests, especially in their current state of relations among themselves, are never gonna to cobble together a good decision uh, ab initio. Um, it, it really critically depends on the extent to which the Secretary General and the Secretariat uh, is able to put clear recommendations for political strategy, not too detailed ones, I, I agree. Um, so an awful lot of discussion sort of talks as if mandates begin with the Security Council, political strategy begin with the Security Council. 
they don't and they shouldn't. Uh, they begin uh, with recommendations from the Secretary General. I very much agree with that, uh, Karen. Well, to add a, something positive that has happened there, I think this is an area where there is much more scope, certainly, for the Secretariat to be forceful and clear in what it sees as the way forward. But the sec Secretariat itself is under a lot of pressure. I mean, what we've said about the SG being under pressure applies, uh, as you know, Jean-Marie, to the rest of the Secretariat as, as well. And I think one positive development in recent years is the use of independent strategic reviews. Um, commissioning an independent review of a particular uh, peace operation and the situation it's dealing with isn't without risk, but it is a way of re-examining key assumptions about emissions effectiveness, about the strategy it's pursuing, and proposing directions that the Secretariat may not feel able to propose. To take one example, last year's uh, independent review of MONUSCO, which called for the Force, uh, Force Intervention Brigade to be wound down that may not have been a recommendation that the Secretariat would have felt uh, able to make as strongly and clearly as that independent review did. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a very important uh, point. I mean, I, I was involved in a semi-independent <laughs> uh, <laughs> review and I, I could see the, the value of being completely independent uh, so that you really contribute to the debate. You're not just uh, in the, caught in the tactics, so to speak, of the secretary. But I think, Said, you wanted to, to add that. Yeah, uh, I also want to join Karen in saying the importance of the independent uh, review uh, exercises. I was also involved in one of them, and I, I see the merit. And uh, I also, as you said, uh, Jean-Marie, I also enjoyed the, the independent aspect of this, of this review, because really, you put in it exactly what you feel is in the best interest of the United Nations. But my second point is I believe that the Security Council and the UN stand more chance to, uh, to, direct the, to have a direct strategic uh, orientation of the mission when it undertakes prior consultations with the concerned regions. And in the case of Africa, you remember uh, Jean-Marie when you were about to deploy UNAMID, you and we went on a joint assessment mission together. And I think this uh, working together with the region to get as much information as possible from the region, from the UN country team, is essential for framing the, the, the strategy of the mission and for the Secretariat and the Security Council to be able to, to guide the, uh, the, the, the mission. And the last point is, the, in this context of consultation between the UN and AU, uh, sp speaking from an African perspective, the relations between the Council and the PSC from the African Union are not easy, uh, to say the least. I mean, there have been up and downs in the relations. Thus, the importance of the relations between the Secretariat of the UN and the Commission. And we are lucky that building on what we have done in the past, the relations are excellent. And they, I think that the Secretariat, the UN Secretariat, has a, a big responsibility in ensuring that they work closely with the region. In this case, Africa, but it could be in other, uh, other region to make sure that the input of the region is in, uh, included in the strategy of the mission. Uh, to, <clears throat> to, to add a point, I think what complicates uh, things uh, today is that conflicts are much more multi-layered. So uh, when you were, I mean, uh, tw 20 years ago, when you were dealing with uh, Sierra Leone, Yes, there, there could be some external uh, interest, but not so many. Uh, yes. And so there was much more space in that, in that sense. Now, there are very few conflicts where there is not some meddling for big powers uh, who are trying to, to use that conflict in their own, for their own uh, strategic uh, uh, goals. And that, <clears throat> that really uh, makes things much more complicated. But uh, Said, you, you insist on the, on the need for, for the UN with the AU to be uh, an orchestra rather than a series of uh, mm -hmm. uh, dissonant uh, uh, musics. Uh, what I see, nevertheless, is that, as you, I think, also said, uh, there, there are more and more I mean, dissonant uh, music. So it's, 
there's a question of coordination, but there's a question of real agreement because the, the agreement that is not in the Security Council uh, is not in the international community, uh, more broadly uh, speaking. I don't know if you want to speak to that, uh, Karen, because you've been watching the, the interaction between the, the AU and the UN and you know, the organizations. Well, as you, as you spoke, I was thinking about the case of Ethiopia, um, yeah. where clearly there is a, a strong current of interest in saying, let's not have the Security Council discuss this. You know, there's active deterrence to having the Security Council discuss Ethiopia and the suggestion that this should be pro appropriately dealt with by the AU. But uh, I put the question back to you, do we see the AU taking this up and, and really dealing with it with, with, with both hands? So, I mean, dissonant music or maybe no music, I, it's hard to see where the driver of political action on a case like Ethiopia currently is. But let me also say in fairness that I uh, imagine there is a great deal going on behind the scenes uh, by different actors that we don't necessarily see. Yes, and much is made of the sort of quiet uh, diplomacy, but uh, is that quiet diplomacy <coughs> effective? <laughs> uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's just a cover for no diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's my, uh, my, my fear. Uh, Jan Martin, I think you wanted to say no. Uh, I oh, I, Karen was thinking of Ethiopia. I was thinking of Libya um, and yep. I'm afraid you know, the situation that has uh, kept uh, the SRSG post in Libya vacant goes back to how badly the AU was treated uh, in 2011. Um, uh, treated, I think, to be fair, not so much by the UN as by uh, the leading intervening countries uh, in, yeah. in Libya at that, at that time. So uh, uh, I'd blame the French and the British more than I'd uh, more than I'd blame the UN Secretariat for that, uh, that situation and those scars. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it's it's extremely difficult. I mean, I, I would want to make one different point, and 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 that goes to sort of flexibility. Um, uh, and I'd like to refer again to the Hippo recommendation of a of a sort of two stage mandating process again largely framed in the context of, uh, of setting up new missions. Um, but there is too much inflexibility once the Security Council has taken a, a mandate decision uh, and it doesn't sufficiently leave the door open uh, to uh, discussions on the ground, discussions with the regional actors, you know, to further shape something that uh, certainly when crisis decision making happens in the Security Council, you know, is mo made, uh, as I think uh, Mr. Brahimi once said, at the moment of maximum ignorance rather than at the moment when you're most effectively engaged. So um, uh, at some point, I think we want to come on to how one builds more flexibility to adapt to uh, the need for political strategies to evolve as situations change. Yeah, and in the interaction between, for instance, the African Union and the United Nations, we have this, these regular meetings, but they are more like, they, are, they have a kind of ritualistic uh, uh, atmosphere. I mean, uh, one wonders whether it wouldn't be better to to be able to call a, a meeting uh, uh, depending on an evolving situation and have a, a real an open discussion. Uh, you, uh, Said you wanted to know? Uh... Yes, absolutely. I, I, I have attended some of these formal meetings. They're very formal and uh, really not very productive. And sometimes there they're, uh, they're are some more difficulties than, uh, than anything else. I, I agree with you that I think uh, the you remember when you were there and we were working from you from the UN and me at the AU, I remember you calling me at three o'clock in the morning because of the time difference. I apologize you know? for that. <laughs> <laughs> I still I still have that, you know. That means, you know, you have to be on, on uh, I, I hope, I, I guess, uh, and I'm sure that the, there is the, the same relations now between the 
the EU Commission and the, and the leadership of the UN Secretariat, I think you should discuss issues as they develop. Uh, when it comes to formal meetings, yes, you should have to have some formalities. But the most important thing is done while the things are developing. And that's, and you mentioned earlier, and I, I, will, I will say it at some point, the importance of, of the UN invoice in the field. And especially you have mentioned regional offices. I have led regional office and they saw how much head of regional office have been instrumental in bringing the UN, the AU, and the regional economic groupings together. They have been really cementing the relations between the three organizations. Karen, you wanted yes. I, I wondered to what extent <coughs> many SRSGs feel constrained by their mandates in this regard. I wouldn't have picked that as a typical experience, but where I do think there have been challenges and picking up on Sai Jinit's point of uh, trying to knit everyone together. I've been in situations where with a given um, council member, one is hearing a lack of cohesive position between the representative locally, where one is the ambassador, what the capital is saying and what the mission in New York is saying. So I feel that some of our job through discussion and trying to get a, a shared narrative about mm -hmm. what's going on in the political strategy, one is also working deep within member states' own failure to agree their narrative about what the situation is and, and where it should go. And really, uh, Hurting, uh, it is a case of hurting cats, getting, getting all these views around a similar strategy is not easy. And that's certainly not gonna happen in a formal consultation where everyone is sitting around a table giving their official positions. No, that's, uh, that's an important point. I, I want to move the discussion a little uh, further now because we, we have spoken about the, the division in the Security Council, the need uh, for the Secretary General to assert uh, himself. Uh, but all that is happening in a context where more and more actors in the world think that it's better to create facts on the ground to, than to, to go to politics. Uh, that's, uh, that's the reality uh, of our world. So when we talk about the primacy of politics, uh, uh, one of the problems is that many actors see that uh, to achieve their political goals, uh, Force uh, is is uh, is the better is the better option. Uh, we have seen it in, in many situations, and in Libya, we have been uh, and in in various uh, in Yemen and uh, in Syria and uh, in a variety of uh, of places. Uh, and uh, so the, the question really there is, how can the UN in a in a world where uh, asserting force, uh, creating facts on the ground becomes more and more the, uh, uh, the preferred option. Uh, how can you react to that? And I would add to that, and I would connect to that point, the, the terrorism point, because you, when, you, when you have uh, groups uh, who, who have a transnational agenda, uh, whereas the notion of a, of a negotiation uh, is remote. Uh, what do you do with them? Or do you? Uh, and there, there, there you, you see, there are very different views in the international community. That there, there are those who love all the terrorists together, and there are those who would want to peel off uh, some groups from from others. So, how do you create a space uh, for for politics? Uh, that is, uh, it, it is, it is a pressing uh, question. And the UN, and you see it in the Sahel, finds itself squeezed uh, between uh, a strategy of a number of countries, which is essentially a military strategy, uh, trying in the midst of that military strategy to, to protect the political space. So uh, this is a new, this is a different context, which raises, in a way, a much more existential question uh, than what we have been discussing uh, so far. No, who wants to? And you probably all have uh, something to say on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I, if I can start from Hippo again, because we wrestled quite a lot uh, uh, in our discussions about how to define the 
proper limits to the use of force by UN operations. Uh, uh, you know, obviously there are situations in the world where force is appropriate, um, but that doesn't mean that it's the job of the UN to uh, uh, apply that force and the distinctiveness of the UN should be in uh, its peacemaking, peacekeeping, peace building uh, responsibilities. We said very clearly that uh, the UN should not be involved in counter-terrorism operations. We drew the line there. Um, we, many of us actually felt that the red line had already been crossed with the mandate for the Force Intervention Brigade and the mandate uh, for Northern Mali uh, of MINUSMA. Um, we didn't go all the way to saying that was inappropriate because some of our members thought that we couldn't tell the Security Council that uh, they shouldn't have uh, they shouldn't have done that. But we did say that uh, uh, any kind of use of offensive force by UN operations should be uh, considered only with extreme caution, which really was our way of saying that we uh, that, that, that we didn't think it was it was appropriate. Um, um, and I think that's still uh, that that that's still where the red line should be drawn um, uh, and uh, I view with some dismay the extent to which uh, uh, Minusma in Mali um, is so directly linked to uh, bilateral counterterrorism operations. Karen? I just add that one of the big concerns I see with counterterrorism is that it's being used as a carve out in the Security Council, uh, in Security Council products to create exceptions or exemptions to other binding legal regimes, whether human rights or IHL. It goes without saying that some countries use the terrorism rubric with a very broad brush uh, to the point of subjecting entire population groups to intolerable violations of, of basic rights. And there absolutely needs to be more discussion of that than, than we are seeing anywhere near the Security Council. But I also want to add another uh, point to your earlier question, which is, I think the focus of our concerns in this discussion has been a lot about council members themselves uh, undermining or pushing in a particular direction. But I think, we also need to talk about a number of um, middle powers that are moving more strongly into force, forceful, forcible interventions internationally and the problem this, this creates. Uh, who is ready to temper some of those interventions? This is really offstage from the council. Uh, yeah, I think it's a fundamental question because the, the kind of discord at the center uh, feeds into uh, uh, regional uh, rivalries and more assertive regional powers that uh, misbehave just as the global power misbehave. Uh, and so there is this sort of sense of free for all uh, that uh, begins to dominate the discussion and that's a, a big issue. And this is probably where your question about whether a Biden administration will make a difference, I think becomes a really critical question, whether there will be a move to try and uh, engage with and hose down some of the uh, forcible consequences of regional rivalries. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not entirely off stage from the council when uh, it's dependent upon strong alliances with members of the council, when it involves flagrantly breaching council sanction. Indeed. Absolutely, absolutely aided and abetted <laughs> by, by the council, by council members. <laughs> yeah. Say the on the counterterrorism. What do you because uh, this yeah. is something that now is infecting Africa. What do you? Yes, what? I, 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 my my view, and uh, I was intending to say it at the end as uh, final remarks. But uh, in my view, you know, you have been deploying. The EU has been deploying peace operations, and in an increasingly complicated context and complex context. context. And honestly, I then see. Uh, a choice for the UN than deploying in those situations. 
and it's difficult to make to to draw a boundary between the peacekeeping uh, role where there is peace to keep or no peace to keep and counter terrorism activities uh, or law enforcement like in the DRC or counter terrorism in uh, and law enforcement in uh, in uh, in Somalia and in in Mali i think we have to be imaginative we have to deal with situation on a case by case we should as much as possible keep the role of peace mission in its traditional role so that it could have uh, leverage for political role as much as possible knowing uh, very well that the the ground is uh, is is crowded because of so many interferences by regional and international uh, actors but still we should leave that role for the for the mission but at the same time it cannot but uh, support um, the activities in Mali uh, counter tourism it provides some kind of support logistical limited but also a very important role of uh, of uh, human rights compliance both in Mali in Sahel and in uh, in Somalia and in Congo i think this is a very important role for the peace mission so it has a role it should limit it as much as possible but it should interact with the other uh, activities whether uh, counter terrorism or law enforcement yeah you say case by case so we, if we look at a case like uh, Sahel and Mali for instance we we see all the difficulties because in this is an area where you have some groups uh, which do have a transnational agenda and it's it's difficult to see how you're going to, to to negotiate with them but at the same time they recruit among people who have local grievances uh, and they have local grievances for good reasons because the government is not delivering uh, because uh, uh, the state is not doing a basic job uh, and so it's for the united nations uh, to be uh, side by side with people who are shooting at some of the people you should be talking to, uh, it, it's a kind of a problem, if I may say. <laughs> yes, I, I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I have the same, yes, I know beyond the, the, the young people who are uh, going and joining the, uh, the, the, the armed groups, there are serious grievances of governance, economic, political governance, and marginalization, which needs to be addressed and addressed through some kind of dialogue. So there is room for discussion with some elements, but there are some elements which clearly <laughs> cannot be discussed uh, at all. I see that we have a very big audience uh, today, so we should uh, maybe uh, uh, turn to the audience and uh, uh, look at some of the questions. There is a question from Jasbir Lida, uh, and I say hello uh, uh, to, to him, uh, asking the UN uh, Security Council mandates continue to address short-term conflict resolution initiatives and offer little guidance to political stakeholders at addressing root causes uh, or, offer, or offering long-term comprehensive guidance to missions. How can this be improved? So the, the connection between the short term and the and the longer term, which in a way is also, I mean, the, the connection between various types of engagement of the UN, from um, and the office in Burundi to I mean, uh, to, to uh, UNDP, I mean, the, the continuum of uh, UN uh, support. Um, who wants to address that? I, yeah, I mean, go ahead. And then uh, Said, I think. Sorry, you, you. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. sorry, sorry, sure. Well, I, I, you know, I think there are a couple of things in current discussions that that point in the right direction. Um, one is a sort of whole of UN system approach to strategizing in particular contexts uh, with, an, in some ways, a strengthened role of resident coordinators uh, um, uh, with um, uh, the uh, peace building office now incorporated in DPPA and therefore hopefully closer to uh, uh, political strategizing there. 
Um, that's one answer. The other answer, and maybe I'm setting up Karen again because I know she's uh, said this much more eloquently than I have. Um, the other is a kind of a, a, a political economy analysis of situations. There is an increasing recognition that that's not been a strength of uh, UN strategizing and, and needs to be. So those are just perhaps two pointers. Karen, you were. <laughs> oh, so absolutely, absolutely. I think so. We're talking about incredibly complex situations, as as you outlined, uh, Jean Marie. It is expecting a lot of an SRSG to fly in and grasp that, which also strengthens it. Strengthens strengthens the case for two things. It strengthens a better leadership selection process. But it also strengthens the case for better teamwork. And I know there are many other actors, but if we're focusing on the UN, let's focus on the engagement of the country team as well, the agencies, funds, and, and programs. Uh, I, there was a, a very good report from UNUCPR a few months ago that pointed out um, the importance of political economy as a conflict driver. And my view has been, and some of us remember a short-lived, I think it was OSCE initiative that put public financial management as a clear element of, uh, of sustaining peace. This is something host governments are incredibly sensitive uh, to. But if we look at something like Liberia, uh, my, my greatest worry is the failure after decades of peace engagement of different kinds, the failure to address the centuries old elite capture of the economy. And part of the problem there is that members of the Security Council still choose to cleave to these silos of development, human rights and security in a very narrow interpretation. And my hope is that by involving country teams more and trying to understand the breadth of root causes, let's call them, that we get to that broader understanding of all the um, inputs that are needed to help get to peace and stay there. Yes, and one could talk about Libya too, uh, and follow the money. Uh, and that requires a whole new set of expertise uh, for the UN, because it's, it's really, uh, there's almost a need for some kind of forensic uh, capacity to to identify the flows of money and the, and in a in a period where we see more and more criminalization of conflict where you have actors who have an interest in keeping the conflict uh, going because they may they a little bit of conflict is not good is not bad for their interest uh, that uh, that would require much more I mean the focus of, of the UN I couldn't agree more uh, said the uh, you have a reaction to the, on that debate? Yeah, I mean, I agree with my colleagues, and I mentioned earlier on the importance of the involving the UN country teams in the planning of uh, peace missions, because more often than not, they after the peace mission leaves the country, the UN country team and the resident coordinator have a role to play in sustaining peace in that country. And I have, or I have been working with country teams in... In, in, in the places I, 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 was, uh, I, uh, I was in charge. And uh, some of them have been work, doing a lot of job and uh, excellent job. And uh, some of them have been involved in uh, uh, helping the host countries establish architecture for peace, you know, internal architecture for peace to, to sustain peace uh, beyond, beyond the peace mission. So I think the UN stand to be more effective when all the pieces join together. So when the peace mission work with the country team ahead of the mission, during the mission, and hand over to the uh, country team. Yeah, yeah. And that, in a way, goes beyond the country team, because in a number of situations, it would be good to have the, the, the IMF, IMF and World Bank and others, of course. World Bank and even the, now the IMF, because you see when the yeah. role of a central bank, for instance, in Libya, yeah. is something of uh, great, great importance. A ADB and others, yes, there are so many. Yeah. Uh, I sorry, uh, Karen. I was just going to jump in to acknowledge one of the questions about listening to the local population, and this is really where other actors also have an important role. It can be difficult for 
the SRSG to get out of the SRSG bubble and connect to what people far outside the capital are saying and, and thinking. Um, plus, I don't think that's one of the qualities that SRSGs are necessarily recruited for, like listening skills. Um, I did not know you were British. <laughs> but there are, there, there, are, there are others who are better placed mm -hmm. to pick up uh, local sentiments and local currents, but they, those need to transmit back to, uh, to the leadership. But that is a really important point. One can get completely, one can become imprisoned in a certain narrow capital-based view of the situation in the country. Yeah, that's essential. The sort of capital-centric view of many of many missions and uh, the lack of uh, feel for pulse of what's going on beyond the capital. And, it, and then you focus purely on elite deals without any sense of how you're going to have uh, roots in, in, the, in the country. Uh, I see another question from Kevin Kennedy. Uh, the speakers in the session have made clear that the success or failure of peace operations depends not on their technical performance, quote unquote. It depends on actors and factors. Uh, operations cannot even influence, much less control. The secretariat and groups like Challengers are invested heavily in improving the machinery of peacekeeping. Shouldn't there be more attention to the political work of pressuring the key actors uh, today's speakers have mentioned, which which raises big question because it's uh, also should how should an SISD how much time should he spend in the mission uh, doing the kind of field work uh, that uh, you just mentioned, Karen, uh, being close to having his ears close uh, her ears close to the ground, but also uh, taking the time to go to capitals to uh, make sure that. Uh, Things are not being undermined uh, outside the country. And, th and that balance between the presence in the country and the bigger picture, that's not so easy to, uh, to, to define. Who wants to, to react to that? Said. <laughs> well, well, I think, we, we, I mean, I think as a special representative of the Secretary General, whether a peace mission or uh, regional office, we all had to go to do some uh, damage control, to limit the, uh, the I mean, to have the most, uh, to seek contri positive contributions by regional actors and international. We all had to go to New York, to Paris, to Brussels, to some of them to China and, uh, and uh, Moscow. Now you should go to Arab uh, states and uh, other uh, stakeholders who are involved in conflict situations in the world and in Africa in particular. So there is a lot of role for the UN envoy in, in, in ensuring that we try as much as possible to work together towards fulfilling the objective of the mission because the mission enjoys the support of the Security Council and more often than not the support of the region in which uh, it, it operates, uh, where it operates. So therefore, it, the, the special representative has a big responsibility in that. Yes, I was recently uh, on a panel uh, of IPI with Jeff Feltman, uh, where we were discussing this role of uh, regional uh, offices, and he's a great supporter of it. And I must say he makes a, a pretty compelling case, but it raises a serious question because the idea is that a region, the head of a regional office, if he or she is the right person, obviously always the same, <laughs> the same issue, but if you have the right person in that office, in a way it can be more acceptable to uh, this or that country than the head of a, of a big mission in the country, which looks like a sort of tutelage and can uh, create very negative uh, reactions uh, uh, rather quickly. I mean, once uh, the first period of uh, uh, love is is over uh, and so there may be a distribution of roles where uh, heads of regional offices can uh, can do a lot of political work uh, that uh, sometimes the head of the the, the, the mission in the country uh, has more difficulty doing but 
of course, then they must not work at cross purposes. They have to, uh, and so it raises uh, other issues. Well, I mean, any any of you has views on that? Uh, I think uh, Jan and then Said. Well, I mean, Said has the experience of actually doing it. I mean, in Hippo, we very strongly supported the role of regional offices, uh, and it's great that everybody is saying how how significant and useful their role is, subject to um, the qualification you make, Jean Marie, about the need to work uh, effectively with others. But the problem is that um, the original conception of, of Lynn Pascoe, when he, you know, tried to get regional offices set up, was to have a complete network of regional offices. Uh, and the reason we only have regional offices in certain regions is because the resistance of member states in other regions is that they don't want, um, uh, you know, a political role in their in their regions. Um, and it's produced a very anomalous situation in which a, a situation can be discussed in the Security Council, take Cameroon, for example, because it falls within the, uh, the remit of a regional office, whereas a, an equivalent situation in another region, you know, the, the council won't touch because uh, um, that would be uh, uh, interventionism in the, in the council. So how we get to uh, a, a fuller pattern of regional diplomacy is is a, uh, is a very difficult question, I, I, I think. Yeah, it's essentially the West Africa office that has been, because there was a balance of powers there that gave it uh, space, but uh, in other so contexts, it's been much more difficult. Karen? Uh, but can I also say that, Ke sorry, Ke Kevin's question also went to, you know, shouldn't we have more discussion about the member state? Part? I mean, it wasn't just about what an SRSG could do, it's what about if you like, the think tank world can do. And I think there's something in that, uh, you know, the council likes to be very tough on scrutinizing the performance of peacekeepers and so on. A bit more scrutiny of the performance of the council and the stripping away uh, a little of the, uh, uh, you know, a little of the veil and facing up to a bit of detail. I mean, when you have an SRSG for Libya, who says he was stabbed in the back by members of the Security Council, uh, I think an analysis of exactly how um, the SRSG was stabbed in the back by members of the Security Council does indeed deserve the kind of focus of, uh, of think tank attention. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think this goes back to my point about does there need to be more calling out or spelling out of these obstacles, including by members of the Security Council. But I just wanted to, this is just a two finger remark, to underline that given how allergic most member states are to being discussed in the Security Council and how hard they work to keep off or keep their friends and allies off discussion in the Security Council. One of the beauties of regional offices, UN regional offices and their reporting is that they will report on those uh, situations and Ian mentioned Cameroon that for other reasons have been off limits uh, in the Security Council even if their circumstances might uh, well warrant a deeper Security Council discussion. So that's, that is um, from where I sit, that's one of the beauties of regional offices, but it is probably also one of the reasons why there is some pushback against having more of them. Said, as the leader of a regional office. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I agreed with what, what, what was said, obviously, and I'm a strong uh, supporter of uh, more regional offices because I have seen the value added of regional offices in being effective. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's through mainly through the regional offices that the UN have been more involved in conflict prevention and mediation. That means in politics, really being involved in politics. And we have seen the limits in peace missions, although there is still room there. But uh, you said the uh, relations between, and Karin has uh, had, uh, had the, the example because we were together in West Africa. My experience is positive. Of course, it depends again on personalities, but uh, well, the, 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 the head of regional office has nothing to do in the, in the, in the internal affairs of any peace mission, like in Liberia or Cote d'Ivoire, whatever. But on, on circumstances, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, you remember when Choi had some difficulties? Well, the Secretary General had called the special, his special uh, representative for West Africa 
to play some role there in bringing together the UN and AU together. And, uh, you know, so there was some room in, uh, in, uh, in the Great Lakes. It's not a regional office, but it is a regional mandate in the DRC uh, at some point, for example, when, uh, when Kabila has asked the, the UN Secretary General to appoint a special uh, a facilitator for the dialogue. And uh, I was asked to play that role. Unfortunately, the, at the end of the day, because of difficulties between the, DP, the, the then DPQO and DPA, uh, they did not uh, respond to Kabila. And as a result, they went to the AU. You see how the UN is not serving its own uh, purpose. But uh, when the special envoy was asked to come and play a role that maybe the SREG in, 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 in Kinshasa cannot play. So there is a complementarity. And I have seen so many cases when there is a role for the special, uh, uh, for the regional office uh, in support of the, of the SRSG. I think it's, it's a good, good uh, combination. Thank you. I see a question which relates to the European Union. Uh, the new EU peace mediation concept, which is adopted uh, on Monday, notes that uh, uh, EU missions in particular could play a supporting role in peace monitoring and mediation. How does this look from UN and AU perspective? Should we welcome uh, peace mediation as a political mission task? Um, so, I mean, I think that the question is really about uh, where does the EU fit in that uh, configuration that we have been discussing? Any taker? I think Said is signaling. <laughs> yes, Said, <Saeed>, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what is, what is the, I have not read, I'm sorry, I have not read, I have seen some papers on, on the new policy because they have been working. I'm in Brussels and I have been attended a number of meetings where they were developing this new uh, concept, the new concept for mediation. Uh, I want to enhance their role in mediation, but uh, I, I, I don't know what they can do more than what they're doing to, today because they have been very effective in supporting peace processes in Africa. I have so many examples when the role of the AU has been so so important. I was the facilitator in a, in a dialogue in, uh, in Guinea and uh, my, uh, the support I got from the European Union was considerable. And today, the, the, the successful uh, mediation was obviously thanks to the work of the facilitators because I was supported by national facilitators, but also of the, of, of the team uh, together with the facilitator, including the EU representative, who was essentially my, my right hand. Actually, he was the main, my main right hand. So I always thought that the EU is in the, in the core group of mediation, although not necessarily in the leadership, because that leadership is mainly played either by the region, the EU, or the UN, because of uh, obvious reasons. Yes, actually, that question, I mean, there's a follow-up to that question uh, by Cedric de Koning. Uh, who says, beyond looking at the performance of a specific mission like MINUSMA, do we need more of a conscious effort to join up the international effort in places like Mali and Somalia, where there are multiple AU, EU, UN, bilateral operations and other initiatives across the security development nexus? What kind of mechanisms can we envision uh, and what should be the role of the Security Council beyond its focus on the UN mission? That's uh, uh, that's a very important question today because it's more and more we see a, a multitude of actors. So who wants to react to, to that? Well, I, I could react by wishing Cedric the very best of luck in um, uh, <laughs> achieving that in relation to Somalia and uh, navigating the extraordinary complexity of interests of member states and multilateral organizations that that involves. I mean, yes, absolutely we need that. And certainly we need that in, in Mali and in, and, and in other places. Uh, but it certainly goes to you know, some of the greatest difficulties in terms of getting different parts of the international system to, uh, to, to, to work together and the very argument as to whether the UN alone should look at the whole international configuration in Somalia or the UN should be looking at the international configuration in Somalia with the AU and, and others just shows that difficulty. So very much needed, very difficult to, to do. Maybe the first answer is that um, more of it needs to be done um, 
uh, you know, outside the formal structures, that it becomes a sort of a, a, a partly a think tank function to the extent that it's very difficult to uh, agree a basis in which organizations will do it themselves. Karen, any reaction? Yes, I mean, I would, I would assume that if they wanted to be more joined up, they would be. It's because mm -hmm. they're bringing these different interests and, and priorities exactly. that everyone is there in, in the first place. And uh, I, I think imposing structures, there is not a hunger from the actors themselves for more structures and more you know, organization and, and coordination. That will, that's what we're struck with, stuck with. But if I can come back, and this is sort of my final uh, point as well, these different actors, these different interests, but there's another factor too in going back to HIPPO, which recognized the mismatch between the expectations of peace operations and what they're actually able to, um, yeah. to deliver. I think the other area that will widen that gap between expectation and delivery is that the very nature of security threats continues to broaden. And we've touched on several of them in this, in this conversation. Peace operations have changed, and peace operations, I think, in some ways are steadily uh, improving the way they use, use intelligence, which used to be an unspeakable, mm -hmm. um, the way they use uh, technology. But peace operations, as they're currently conceived, and as the Security Council conceives them, don't hold uh, responses to cyber cybersecurity threats, for example, which are growing including in the hands of private actors and, and contractors uh, to pandemics, other than incidentally, if they happen to be there, to terrorism, as we've, as we've discussed, to the use of mercenaries and contractors uh, as central actors in conflict, to rampant sanctions violations, to organized crime, as you mentioned, uh, Jean-Marie. You know, we don't find solutions to those questions within peace operations, for one reason, because a number of these broadened security threats aren't receiving much attention in the Security Council at all. Um, you know, it's thanks, only thanks to Estonia that we've had the first formal discussion of cybersecurity in the Council this, uh, this year. That's not accidental. I mean, when we talk about better structures and stuff, the some states want to use the council's authority to the max. Uh, others want to blunt its potential and to torpedo that kind of uh, initiative. I have a concern that there are now so many blackout areas for what the council can discuss that they will soon overwhelm the topics that are discussable and the situations that are discussable in the Security Council. So it again comes back to, do we call out some of these things more clearly, whether it's the SG or think tanks saying, let's talk about where some of these real threats are and the council's failure to address them head on. We have to do that. We have to do that before we can talk about what a peace operation is able to do. That, that's, a great, uh, that's a great concluding thought. Uh, uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, Ian and Said, do you have uh, similar thoughts to, to conclude our, our session? Jean-Marie, I, I listened to you and um, uh, Paul Williams and others in the discussion the other day, and I've looked at the papers looking at the future context for peace operations uh, from DPO's project. I don't think we know where the future is taking us, but what I think we need to focus on is how the UN becomes more flexible and more smart and more intelligent in its ability to respond to unpredictable developments because we're not really able fully to predict them and to get over the kind of bureaucratic obstacles whether it's distinctions between peacekeeping operations and political missions, whether it's budgets, peacekeeping assessment that can't be used for African Union uh, missions, break down those, build up the analytical and strategic capacity, and then, you know, situations that we can't fully predict can be responded to in flexible ways rather than by old templates. Thank you. Said. Well, I mean, the next years, um, I'm afraid, will not be easier than 
what the uh, less complicated than the situation we are facing today. I, I, I am. I am of the view that peace uh, operation will be deployed in more complex and uh, complicated uh, uh, complicated context. And uh, I uh, uh, I believe that uh, I mean our experience is that it has been difficult to resolve conflicts because of the what we have seen. You know the complexity of the problems, the interferences by regional international actors. It takes more than ten years, two decades to solve a problem. That's why my view for the next decade, I think the UN and the African Union should revisit prevention. That's the only way of going back to politics is revisiting conflict prevention. I remember in the early 90s, the United Nations and the OAU at that time has prioritized uh, conflict prevention. But in fact, we have been overwhelmed by conflict management and resolution. I think time has come that we should prioritize again conflict prevention, and in the independent review I, I made of the relations between cooperation between the UN and the African Union, I suggested that the UN and AU should commission a joint report on conflict prevention, because I think we should be more audacious in conflict prevention. We have been a little bit, I think, shy on conflict prevention. I think we should revisit conflict prevention for the next decade. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to summarize what has been a very rich discussion, but for me, the main takeaway is that in a world that's going to remain very divided, uh, very polarized, uh, and which is fast changing, as uh, Karen uh, reminded us, uh, there is a gap of thinking and political leadership. And uh, there is really a need for the UN to occupy, it, to occupy that, that space, because uh, nobody is going to occupy it for it. And, and that, that goes at all uh, levels, uh, frankly. And I think for, it is not uh, just about the Secretary General asserting the role of the UN, it's, it's SRSGs, it's staff in the mission, realizing that if they expect the international community, which is a myth rather than a reality today, uh, to give them marching orders, they can expect for a very long time indeed. Uh, what they need to do is really have the, uh, the energy, the creativity, to think through what would be good for the people they are expected to serve. And, uh, and so it's a, for me, it's a call to responsibility at all levels in the UN to, to really uh, address issues that are destroying the lives of many people and that uh, need to be addressed and, sh and can be addressed, but that requires uh, will at all levels. Well, thank you all uh, and uh, Good luck to the peace uh, to the peacekeepers to the uh, political uh, uh, players around the world uh, to fight the good fight. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much, Jean-Marie Gueno, for leading this conversation in such a masterful way. And indeed, you managed to get some really crisp and interesting views from all of you, Carrie and Said and Ian. We will now have 15 or actually 12 minutes break before we can get back on and listen to the final takeaways, key takeaways from this week's free dialogue strands and the formal closing together with our co-host. So please, 12 minutes break and be back here half past. For those of you participating the whole week, the links are in Hoover. And for those opening the joint session, it's in the other link in the email you received. Thank you. Good.